Nā reira, tātou tēnei, ko tau maine ki te whakarongo, ki o tātou rangatira. Engari, a nei anō te mihi, ki taku tuakana nei, a ki a kaliko mōna, ko tau maine i Hawaii, i haere mai Hawaii rāno. He's come all the way from Hawaii and he's given up and he's changed his um, itinerary of his trip to be here with us for these three days. Ah, in that reira, ke nui, te whakanui atu i a doctor, Professor Kaliko Baker. Aloha. Aloha nui mai Hawaii loa, a hiki nei nei mai kela, ku ono kahale ki e ku ono kahale, aloha nui kākou. So, Tatere just did my speech for me. <laughs> no, I, I, my, my plan was to, there it is, my plan was to keep it simple today because uh, as Professor Zuckerman brought up yesterday, he brought up some key theoretical points to language revitalization, language, well, language death and lang problems surrounding language. I really wanted to talk from here as somebody who's come on in the end of, um, end of our native speakers, I guess. That's kind of sad to say it that way. Um, but, you know, I, I was able to hang hang out with and participate in activities with our some of our last native speakers from outside of Niihau, which is our last um, flourishing community. Um, and now it's, it's like tag, we're it. We have to carry on. So I wanted to come from that perspective and just sort of give you some simple, simple key um, things to look for why why we might why we want um, a language excellency program at uh, in Hawaii. So I titled my talk Iola Ka Olelo, and Ola for us is probably similar to your Ola, um, and Iola means so that it lives. Yola ka oleo, so that our language lives on. And you may wonder why an excellency program is needed in the perpetuation of language. I think it's key. It's essential that we have an excellency program. And I'll make that point later. Need to get this synchronized with that. <laughs> Sorry. Here we go. Um, and then this goes like this. Nope. Nope. Does this, we just click. Oh, you silly <laughs> rabbit. <laughs> of course the bigger part goes in the palm of your hand. <laughs> Why wouldn't it? Isn't that just the natural way things go? I'm sure Timothy will get to that in some of his um, uh, Waiata later. <laughs> The southern, yeah, oh, the water spins backwards. Anyway, okay, um, <laughs> okay. Now that we're having fun, okay. So why why is language important? Uh, the first point it, it it distinguishes us as a people. It distinguishes a certain group of people as distinct from another. That's the demarcation of a, of a of our lahui. For us back in Hawaii, as you can see, I wear a camouflage of white skin. Many of us are like me. There are brown and black fellows as well, but um, we need indices that will sort of carry us through through our uh, through modern modernity in Hawaii to indicate that we are Kanaka. Language is a is a great tool for that. We actually have this. Um, I'll call it an Olelo no Eo, but it came out in an article in 1917 in one of our Hawaiian language newspapers. It said, I ike ia ke kanaka no ke kahi lahui makana olelo. Perhaps um, most of you can pick that up. So a, an individual is known to be from a certain lahui race people by his language. This is key because in the article where this comes out, the author is um, he's waging complaints against um, the people of the time that 
many of the kids that of that time couldn't really speak Hawaiian that well. And that made us think, you know, when come the 90s and whatnot, when I was learning Hawaiian, because um, I'm a second language speaker myself, um, it made me think, well, if back in 1917 the language was weak, what do we have now? Is it even worth it to revitalize our language? We have to consider that question. We have to. And then we have to answer it and find positive ways to do so. Um, so I have the, on the bottom of this slide the word ku'oko'a. Ku'oko'a is used in the political arena to, to refer to sovereignty and those sorts of things. We stand distinct from, uh, well, for us would be America. But in when we talk about people and uh, how they indicate themselves as different from others, ku'oko'a is what we want to be. We want to be able to demarcate ourselves as different people. One of the um, more influ influential readings that I did early on when I first graduated with my BA in Hawaiian language was uh, in Gugi Wathiongo, um, Decolonizing the Mind and Moving the Center. Those two books, if you haven't read them, give it a read. Thin books, you know, Take you no time to read them, but a simple message comes through in those through those books. Essentially, the la the title below, "Moving the Center," captures what he's arguing for. What he, what Ngugi argues for is that he wants you he he wants he wanted for his people to start speaking their language so that they can see the world through the eyes through the lens of their ancestors, and. This is the key reason why we, we're, we're looking towards revitalizing Hawaiian, is so that we can see what our ancestors saw. That is, we can re-empower their worldview and take it as our own, as much as we can, because we live in modern society. And yeah, there's many other aspects that go along with this. Um, so language is um, intrinsically connected to a people. And the colonizer knew this when he came, when they came to Hawaii. Uh, and they use it as a tool to sort of reallocate the minds and the mindsets of, a, of our people. And there we go. And then early on, when the missionaries came in the 1820s, so Kamehameha, our, the king that unified our islands, he died in 1819. Um, Ka'ahu Manu, the, his wife, and his son, Liho Liho, decided quickly that the transition from traditional religion to Christianity would happen. Um, the missionaries jumped on this, and they, used, they translated the Bible into Hawaiian. And to me, I, I look at this personally as the downfall of Kanakadam. Because this is, the, this is the genesis of us losing sight of who we were at the time and becoming someone else. It wasn't the language. Because the language was still intact through the 1840s, 50s, and beyond. I mean, there's evidence of strong language community up until probably the 1880s. And then 1896, we get legislation that bans Hawaiian in the schools and that's when the kupuna would start to, would be beaten in school for speaking Hawaiian, um, or disciplined as they were as they were told. Those things had an effect on the language too. But our actual losing sight of who we were it starts in the 1820s and maybe even before when Kamehameha accepts help from Vancouver with the guns and whatnot and the strategy. Um, but what? What the colonizers came in and used our language as a tool to refocus us on who we, who they wanted us to be. Uh, then 1834 comes along, 1830s come along, and writing takes off. Our people see see writing as what? We don't have to memorize all this stuff anymore. Yeah, so we became literate real quick. Um, like with by the mid 1800s, 90 percent. Something like that, 
some of the numbers that get thrown around, 90% of our, our people were literate. That's far greater than what was going on in America at the time. So newspapers such as Kalama Hawaii, uh, Kanona Nona is another one that comes to mind. These newspapers were set up as tools of the church to, um, to put down our people and where we were, who we, and what we were before. So religion was um, one of the first key aspects of um, Kanakadam that, that the colonizer went after. So they went after our religion to try to knock it out. Religion, as you know, shapes how we indigenously look at the world. Uh, that is, it intrinsically um, de determines what we view as important and relevant to our existence. So the first newspaper is they shamelessly put down our Hawaiian ways and customs, attempting to replace what was once our ways with their ways. I, re I recall I did some, I mean, I'm interested in folklore, well, what's called folklore in the study of linguistics, I guess, and literature. Um, I was interested in, in the term ka'au for us. Ka'au is a, generally it, it means folklore or tales and stuff. Um, but I came across in, I think it was Kalama Hawaii. It was this, is a quote, it says, Imeaha ke ka'au. So what is a, a ka'au for? Imea e aoe kanaka. It's for teaching people. So these, within this um, colonizer's newspaper, they knew what tools to use in our language to get us to start thinking the way they did. And they did it well. They would tell us all the all these stories about Jerusalem and other things that um, they found important through our language to sort of reset our mind and how we we view the world as oh, or as what we view as important in the world. Yeah. So therefore, Ka'al were used by these early newspapers to instruct our people on the ways of Christianity and the wrongs of what was called ho'omanaki'i, or idol worship. It, worship. And I look at this as, um, as a time when we can look back and we have another olelo no'ia, or wise saying that comes up, wahelea kula kanaka i kalalau. That's a play on um, kalalau. It says people have gone to kalalau. Kalalau is a beautiful place, mind you. It's on Kauai. But the, the word Kalalau, the name of the place, Lalau means to go off on a path that doesn't really lead you to the place you should be. So if somebody's wandering and just sort of drifting and going, doo -doo 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 -doo, you might say to them, ah, well, he Kalalau. He's drifting, he's wandering, he's not paying attention to what he's doing. So I, I say at that time, probably till now, we're still in Kalalau. Um... So turning around, so makahana kaike is a saying we have. So in in work, there's language. It's generally how it's interpreted. It's also an available interpretation for this uh, olelo no eo is through action one learns. So through speaking, I believe we believe we will be able to recapture some of the ways of our elders and recapture our identity who we are, and define for us who we will be. I was working with, um, uh, what, did, what did Tatere say? Te Atua O Te Leo? Te Atua. He, he um, yes. Just pony that one, just, just anoint him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wonderful host. He's hosting me. Wonderful man. We've had many great conversations over the past few days, months actually, um, and he's helped. He's done nothing but help us. I know you don't like this, Timothy, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> Since the '80s till now, he's done many things to help our people, and we're very thankful. And he's brought many Maori over to help us out, and we're very appreciative of the, the programs that we have today that are modeled after what you guys do here. So, mahalo anui ya oko paulua. Um, Okay, back on track. So, 
You see, we can use it on me. Thank you. I enjoy Kalalau. As I said, it's a beautiful place. It's loved by hippies nowadays, but anyway. Um, moving on. <laughs> we don't have to talk about hippies. Okay. So, there are many ways to define oneself. You know, cultural practice is one. It's good. Kapahaka is a great tool to, to sort of overtly project your identity and I'm not jealous um, things like traditional dress is another way to do it uh, you know um, and language language is a it does more than project our identity I believe it's it it really goes into the Maoli the Maoli Modi yeah? as you guys have yes the Maoli within and it it, it it sort of taps that. A lot of our people talk about our ancestral DNA and our ancestral memory through our DNA, I believe is what they say. And you know, once you tap that, you, you can have a, this well of knowledge that you, you'll have access to. And for me, I, I look at, not for me, for us, language is, is an easy access code to get to that, to get to the Maori. Um, I have a family. Uh, a wife and two children. We only speak Hawaiian. Only speak Hawaiian to each other. In fact, I find it offensive when my kids use an English word to me. And they they get scolded more for weaving in English words and even English thoughts into conversations with us than other sort of transgressions they might have. And they know this, and they know this, and they act appropriately. But we're odd. My family is odd in Hawaii, and it's it's quite it's it's sort of um, it's sad. It's it's sad for us. It's sad for our people. And but we what we do is we when we speak Hawaiian, we speak Hawaiian at home, and maka it says makahale, maka makeke in the market, manawahi apau everywhere we go. That's all we do is speak Hawaiian. When we go around and we're speaking Hawaiian, and you know, my kids they carry the same camouflage that I do. Um, they're like, oh, people are like, oh, look how cute they're speaking Hawaiian, so cute, so cute. And I, you know, my kids look at me, and I look at my kids, and I'm like, cute, <laughs> cute. Well, that means you're ugly. <laughs> do you want to be ugly? And we say things like that in Hawaiian, and we roll laughing, you know, we're rolling, we're just laughing and with each other, at them. <laughs> and then the best part about it is, you know, is sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's more prominent Hawaiians, you know, that say, oh, how wonderful that you speak Hawaiian in your family and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, really? Yes, we're wonderful. Don't you want to be wonderful too? So we have to take it from lip service to, uh, to action. Um, moving towards language excellency. I haven't said anything about it yet. <laughs> we're moving towards it. It's going to be like, boom, and we're done. OK, so that's the dramatic structure of this, if you haven't. I thought it happened with this. Anyway, um, so at home, my wife is a professor of theater. Um, at Manoa, UH Manoa. And since 1995, we, because what she does, I do. That's kind of what couples do, I guess. Um, what I do, she doesn't do. Does that sound about right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so we do Hanakyaka, or Hawaiian Medium Theater. And we thought at the time that this was something new for people. Turns out it wasn't. As more newspapers came online, research was easily available for us. We found that our people did Hanakyaka in the 1800s, more so towards the late 1800s, but they did Hanakyaka. That is the adaptations of traditional stories told through the medium of Hawaiian staged on, on the, in the theater. Um, so what we've done is we take traditional stories, mo'olelo, ka'ao, those sorts of things, and Ho'anoho made them fit into the theater. And 
we take them around and we take them to our to the communities, uh, the Hawaiian language communities around the islands. Now, what does this do? Yeah, what does it do? In these um, hanakyaka, we use we use I guess high level Hawaiian. We don't we don't try to water down the Hawaiian at all for our people to make it more palatable for the language that's being spoken today. So what this does is it creates an environment where people are motivated to be better speakers and, and hopefully inspiring them to be better speakers, to understand more about these, these histories that we put forth. And inspiration, as um, Professor Zuckerman said yesterday, is key in a language revitalization movement. So if you guys can speak Māori, Kaoleo Kūnawo Ya Oko, I implore you to to be motivational, to 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 model for your people, because it's important. And you know the jokes I made earlier about being in the market speaking Hawaiian, and you're cute, and why don't you be cute like us? Yeah, those are jokes, but really, we don't we we don't try to overly put our people down at all. No, we this is jokes between us, and. But really what we try to do is inspire other families to maybe speak Hawaiian, you know, maybe take the time out of their schedules to go and learn. So it's important to be inspirational. And that's, um, get down to, okay. So now we're getting to the establishing a Hawaiian language excellency program. We don't have a name for it yet. We have, what happened, bro? There you go. No? There it is. I must have hit the backwards. Okay, here we go. Never mind. So, um, the three of us got together. Well, I should back up a little bit. A year or so ago, uh, Dr. Rangi Matamua of Waikato University and I met like five years ago, maybe. We were on a panel, just by chance. We got to know one another. Ended up being on his uh, on, a, on a Marsden grant that he has now about Maori astronomy, and because of that connection, I was able to hang out uh, to meet with um, Poe Timata, Professor Poe Timata, and you know talk story with him. And Poe uh, Timata, as you know, Professor Timata, as you know, is working with Timoti and Farihui on on the Panikiritanga project. With that. Um, we had many conversations about the structure of the program and the goals and all those sorts of things. And they were coming, we arranged for the Matapuninga group, the, the Tohunga group to come over to Hawaii because I'm also a Mo'olono, a traditional priest, I guess. Yeah, we just called it that. Um, Tohunga, as, as you guys would call it. And we, I would, organize an exchange with the Matapuninga group to come over to Kaho'olawe where we do our lono practices and just just to go through the motions with us, see if they had anything to offer or we could offer them. And it turned out to be well. And being that they were coming, all Panikiritanga graduates, I thought, ooh, we should have a symposium at home to talk about the Panikiritanga just so that you know maybe we can motivate our people to have, an, have a Hawaiian language excellency program. I'm thinking... I want to be a student in this program. That's what I'm thinking. But maybe I'm just overly humble at times. So I put on, we put in this symposium. The wonderful Timothy comes down and shares some mana'o with our people, some thoughts and the theories behind the program. Uh, over 100 people showed up. And I tried to just put it out word of mouth. I just wanted a few people who would be motivated to get the program done show up so that we could start. But uh, over 100 people showed up on just word of mouth. And there were a few questions, a few comments. Three gentlemen, uh, three of us stepped up and said, okay, we'll try. We'll try to get this thing rolling. That's myself, Kaliko, and then another one, Kalehua Krug, who is pointer. I don't know which one is the pointer. What is that? There it is. Kalehua Krug is the other tall dude right there, or tall guy, gentleman, and Hiapo Pereira. Um, we all decided to get going on um, establishing the program. So we met with um, Teatua. 
the following week. And he gave us a list of dates of when the Panikiritanga was meeting. And he said, well, you should come to April because that's the graduation and the intake. And I said, oh, of course. Well, that was February. <laughs> so we made it happen. We got here. And we were able to, uh, obviously, with this, as this picture illustrates, we participated in a pohidi uh, last Saturday at the Panikiritanga. We've gathered a lot of information, uh, a lot of experiences, and I was asked this morning, oh, so what's your greatest takeaway? For me right now, the greatest takeaway is the relationships that we formed. Um, sure, we got a lot of details on how the program is run. That's important, but I think the, the relationships that we have formed with, um, with people like Leon and Pania and Paraune and because we're all about the same age, even though I'm a little grayer than everybody else. We're all about the same age. Um, and we're all going to grow old together with these excellency programs. At least I hope we are. And I think it's important that we, that we have these relationships as we, as we move on. So what's the, did you move? What's the value? What's the value of an excellency program? Raising the bar. Raising the bar is critical when we're doing, um, when we're talking about language revitalization. Because what raising the bar does, it, it gives room for lower, the lower levels to grow. I like the analogy from my Hawaiian side of the house, the hale. So if we build the hale higher, we're going to need a wider base. So with the wider base, you can have more people on the base of the hale. But... Um, the All Blacks analogy seems to work too, where if, um, if you have a professional sports team and the professional sports teams do, do well, what's going to happen is there are going to be many, many, many more people on the bottom levels wanting to get to that higher level. That's from, I don't know, we call it Pop Warner back home with football. You know, we have Pop Warner or even earlier in that flag football leagues where little kids are running around with their football playing, wanting to play at the professional NFL level someday. Most people don't make it. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But what we need is people willing to be fluent in the rules and regulations of the game. That is, be fluent in our language. Some people will rise to the level of orator. Some people will rise to the level of um, composer, musician, singer, chanter, dancer, those sorts of things. But not all, and that's all right. But what we need is we need that high, the pinnacle, so that they can strive to. That's what establishing an excellency program does. Okay. So the first note here is, I pretty much hit that already. So who's going to attend this? Who's going to be invited to the Language Excellency Program? We're thinking like the 85 to 95, 90 percentile. That is, those who are fairly fluent in Hawaiian, as is the, the case here for um, the Panikide Tonga. Um, and what we want to do is take them to the next 5 percent. So 95, get them to that 95% level. And fluency isn't just grammar or, for that matter, words. It ha grammar and words has a lot to do with it, but it's also the practice of speaking, when to speak, what to say, what are the proper idioms, the axioms, the, the um, proverbial sayings needed in communication. So it's those sorts of things that really push you from speaker to good speaker to approaching orator to orator you know those sorts of that those sorts of trans um, transitions um so i thought pania and leon's talk yesterday with the two sides on their um their table that they gave us yesterday was, was really good in pointing out issues of um pros and cons in, the, in establishing a program like this. Ultimately, I think every con has a resolution, I hope. And if it doesn't, then as I was told, we just leave them behind. 
if people have a problem, we just say aloha, ahui ho, kekahi wa. And we'll see you some other time. <laughs> Why else do it? We do it for the future so that our, um, our people will have, um, have, have their all blacks to, to strive for. Um, within this picture, this is a picture of our hui. They came down for to do a lai kawai, our, la, our latest show at the Waikato University for he Manawa Fenua, the conference this past year. Um, within this picture, there's about 15 people in this picture, I think. Seven. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to change down to, oh, there's the beautiful people. Look at them. I have a screen right here that I'm not looking at. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> this is the beautiful hui right there. Um, as you can see, I'm in the back just trying to herd them like sheep here, right? Sheep and cattle here. So. Okay. 15 people in this picture. Probably seven or eight of them are candidates for our excellency program. Now, this is where the theater and the excellency program has a connection because... What we do nowadays is we pick people who can speak really well, who have good command of our, of our language and all the surrounding um, things you need to know about speaking language. Um, so within this group, yeah, we, we have a pool. And this is just my little group. Now, Kalehua has a group. Hiapo has a group. Other, other people within our community have groups of people. So we have more than enough people to run a few years of our program. And hopefully by the time that, that's done, we can move on. And of course, do it for the, fa the, the ohana, the fauna. This, oh, stop it. I did it again. There it is. Um, this is my family. Yeah. I just want, for me personally, I'd like some place for my son to go and be an excellent speaker someday. He gets a lot of instruction at home. So does my daughter. As you can see, the cute, oh, you can't really see it. Oh, shucks. There's a cute little faded image on the top of he and I on um, the whole Olave when he was young. And quick story, I know I'm going over time. Anyway, quick story. When he went into the Punana Leo, or the Kohanga Leo, as you guys have, he was three. The teachers were like, teachers would come up to him all the time and say, How do you say this? How do you say that? And I'm like, Why am I paying tuition? Why? If my three-year-old has to come in here and teach your teachers how to talk, we have a problem. We don't want to have that problem anymore. We need the excellency program. May ya aloha nui kako. They want to sing a song, as you guys do. Hewayata, hewayata. Pani is texting the TV people, I'm sure. 